The CW Chronicles Sinners Written by Silvano Williams All content copyright 2013-2023 All rights reserved Chapter 5 Heroics I piloted my ship through the Space Armada's barrage of plasma bolts without fear. My every move was a calculated cybernetic affair with total and complete trust in my shuttle's responses and defenses. I steered with one hand while using the other to work the keyboards and scanners, identifying our stolen ships and targeting them with the ion cannons. Even as I lunged into the hailstorm of fire, I was able to shoot at the ships that were on CW's path for him to fall through. Some of them crashed into each other, but none were destroyed. Excellent maneuvering, Vlad. I vaguely heard the commander say to me. His praise sounded sincere, but as far as I was concerned, he had said nothing. My concentration was solely on the armada trying to keep me away, and calculating CW's trajectory within the chaos that surrounded him. I ventured past the boundary and absorbed a few shots just as I pulled away from their line of fire, forced to back off and turn around for another pass. Backup is on the way, the commander announced. We will analyze these scans and figure out where Villain obtained these ships. Vlad, proceed with caution until we arrive. No heroics. I laughed a little, setting up for another charge at the space armada. CW needed me to clear the final path for him. I didn't have time to be careful. Yeah, about that. I muttered under my breath and did a barrel roll into the oncoming attack once again. My attention skipped from screen to screen. No offense, Commander, but I need more screen real estate, I said, turning off the monitors that displayed the Dimension police officers and replacing them with close-ups of the Space Armada vessels in CW's trajectory. I disabled more of the stolen DP ships with my ion cannons and did a quick calculation for the reversed magnetic pulse's time of impact. A monitor displayed a close-up of it with a timer message. Time until impact, 7 minutes 12 seconds. Of course, every attempt at flying into the space armada was just a distraction to encourage them to target me instead of CW, but it was suspicious that none had broken rank and shot him down. Granted they couldn't have hurt him, but still, it was as if they didn't even care that he'd been diving straight at them for miles. Regardless of how many I took down, the gap was never enough for me to get much closer to making any difference. I had a sinking feeling this was just a game, and we had fallen into a trap. Glancing over at the Dimension Police arrival time, I noticed the timer message. 3 minutes 25 seconds. Then just as I turned around for another pass, I caught a bright blast from the burning moon. Villain had shot an energy missile from his hidden position. Damn it, I knew it. This is just a game for that scum, I said, unsurprised, setting my course toward the blast. Its erratic yet lightning-fast trajectory made it impossible to intercept, even by the ship's computers. I wouldn't be able to block it on time. I pushed the intercom button to warn CW. See, brace yourself, I said. You're about to get blindsided by a chaos missile. CW whirled himself around just in time to see the blast coming at him. He shielded his face with his forearms but the explosion knocked him off course. He fell like a burning meteor into the space armada fleet. He landed on his back through one of the stolen Dimension police ships. It was one of the largest spacecraft in Villain's armada, yet CW's massive body easily tore open its hull when he crashed into it. The force of the impact pushed it away from its formation, crashing it against other ships, before it finally ended up hovering in a circle on its side like a dying fish trying to set itself straight. I could hear its interior depressurizing through CW's intercom as the air escaped the cabin. Alarms beeped loudly in the background. C. Are you okay? I asked, but it was an involuntary reaction out of habitual concern. I knew CW was invincible. No longer needing to pull the armada's attention away, I flew away from their line of fire and concentrated on scanning them from a distance. As if the beeping wasn't loud and annoying enough, an ear-piercing shriek tore through my speakers. What in the shit? I yelled out, covering my ears in pain. Looking down at the ship CW was in, I saw what had caused it. 
it was the noise of its damaged hull closing and the metal fusing. As soon as the hull sealed, I heard another strange noise. Heavy breathing. But it wasn't just breathing. It was laborious and guttural, like a dying animal that was panting its last breaths. I couldn't see what was happening, and it annoyed me. It created an image in my head of someone choking to death in front of me while I stood and watched, unable to help. I turned the volume down in disgust. CW started blathering nonsense about the pilot. It all happened very quickly. The whole thing perturbed me, and I didn't want to believe what he was saying. Then, unexpectedly, the entire Space Armada fleet fired another reversed magnetic pulse at the planet. Vlad! Ilona's voice was distant, yet loud enough to wake me up from the trance and the memories. Vlad, I need to speak to you. No, I replied annoyed. I have a headache. I was groggy and had to blink a few times before I made out that I was back in my cell. This again? I asked. I'm sorry, Vlad. Ilona said. I didn't mean to pull you out so suddenly, but you are skipping information. Her voice sounded clearer this time. I know, Ilona. I know. I put my hand to my head, still feeling the sensation of the disgusting breathing pounding in my brain. It's just that when you interrupt me and take me out of the memory, it feels like being awakened right at that moment when you finally fall asleep. Vlad, I need you to tell me everything C.W. saw. Ilona said with a clinical tone. Ilona, you know what was in that ship. Is it vital for me to get into C.W.'s memory? I don't want to recount that. The more information we have, the easier it will be for me to find a way to free you. We need the full story. She explained, this time sounding a little more empathetic. She reached into the cell and extended her hand out to me again. I grabbed it and held it, still hesitant about her request but she was good at persuading me. Looking down at the floor I whispered, I would do anything for you. She took a deep breath and said, I know that. You already have. Our eyes met, and we gave each other a weary smile. I squeezed her hand and feigned perking up for her. Okay, Ilona. I said without much energy left to argue. I'll try to get into as many memories as I can, and tell you everything that happens as I see it. This is the most I've ever seen, and I think if I can remain in there more at a time, the memories will come to me at will. It's becoming progressively easier for me to see things. That's why being interrupted is frustrating. I promise you I'll give you every detail from everyone I can see from now on. Just let me stay in there as long as I can. And what happens when you see things from Villain's perspective? She asked. Villain's reality was grim. There was no doubt about that. What could I do? Just let me write it out, I said. Unless I start convulsing or something dangerous like that, then just put a pillow under my head. Are you sure? She always did a superb job at looking past my cynicism and failed humor but I think she understood I wasn't going to get better at chronicling memories by stopping every two minutes to answer questions. Yes. I nodded my head decisively. I love you, Ilona. I will always return to you. She smiled approvingly and pulled her hand away. See you back here soon. She answered softly, her voice already drifting away. I wasn't bothered by her retreat from the emotional intimacy, we just had, since I was eager to jump back into the mind's memory energy stream again. It was in this realm that I gained bits of knowledge about the cosmos and how its energies worked. I tapped into the mind's energy source, where the experiences of all living beings were stored like a video library of past events. It was easy seeing my own memories, and I was rapidly learning how to select those others I wanted to see by concentrating on what I knew about them. For the time being, I could only see villains and CWs, but I think with more practice I'll be able to see more. I cleared my mind, and focused my attention on seeing what happened after CW crashed into the space armada. Glad. CW called out to me, 
speaking down into the microphone behind the golden medallion on his chest. He was standing inside the stolen Dimension police craft, underneath the hole he had just created on its hull when he crashed into it. See, are you okay? I asked him. I am, but I have to fix this before it completely depressurizes the cabin. He said, fighting against the vacuum that threatened to pull him back out into space. All around him, warning systems beeped loudly and all the monitors flashed red. With a mighty grunt, C.W. grabbed the edges of the broken hull, bringing them together with his sheer strength to seal it. The metal screeched loudly, burning brightly for a few seconds as it fused. Once he repaired the hull, the interior pressure stabilized, and the ship realigned itself back into the formation with the space armada. The alarms quieted down, which allowed C.W. to hear something coming from the cockpit. It was the blood-curdling breathing that had freaked me out. C.W. was unaffected by it. He perceived it as heavy breathing. See? What is that? Who is breathing like that? I asked disgusted. C.W. stepped closer toward the cockpit to investigate. He could see the pilot's head heaving up and down in front of the seat, but couldn't see the rest of him. It's the pilot. He answered me. I think the depressurization affected him. The pilot seemed to become agitated. His breathing became louder and faster, yet he stayed outside of C.W.'s view. Hello. C.W. tried to address him. I will not hurt you. C.W. carefully walked up to the cockpit, slowly reaching out to gently grab the back of the pilot's chair. Don't worry. C.W. chirped, finally standing next to him. I am here to help. Suddenly, Villain's voice boomed through the stolen ship speakers. Fire the reversed magnetic pulse. The pilot obediently reached for the controls in front of him and pulled a trigger. The ship whirled loudly and recoiled upward as it charged and fired. CW grabbed the pilot's chair harder, digging his fingers into it to keep his footing. Why would you do this again? CW asked, horrified. Have you no mercy? He swung the pilot's chair around to face him. What? C.W. began but instead gulped when he saw the pilot. A wave of positive emotion overcame him. He rejoiced. You are alive. See? What in the hell is going on? I crackled in his earpiece. Glad. He replied overjoyed. He knelt next to the pilot and grabbed the cockpit chair on either side with both of his hands. He is alive. The pilot snarled at C.W. Who? What are you talking about? Major Skitties is alive. C.W. answered me cheerfully. But I can see now it wasn't who C.W. thought it was. Instead, it was a mutilated figure that scarcely resembled the Major. Even though I couldn't see what C.W. was looking at, I was incredulous then. Ah. Uh. What? I asked. The pilot wore a tattered Dimension police uniform, caked with a dried blood-like substance. Parts of his body showed signs of fatal damage. Lifeless milky cataracts glazed over his eyes, reflecting the red from the monitors and controls all around him. But from C.W.'s perspective, all he could see with his hopeful eyes was a dirty and mildly hurt Major Skitties. Glad. C.W. said ecstatic. The Space Armada pilots are Dimension Police officers. No way, I replied. Are you sure, man? What are you talking about? C.W. grabbed the ragged meat puppet that resembled the Major by both shoulders and pulled him out of the pilot's chair. He then brought him up to his chest and hugged him. Major Skitties became angry and swatted at C.W. He punched and clawed at C.W.'s chest like an enraged cat. C.W. effortlessly kept him at bay, unconcerned. Hearing the struggle, I asked, What in the hell is that growling, C? It's Major Skitty's lad. C.W. answered me, and gently placed the Major back on his chair. I am so happy. He said. Now I know we can help them. We can solve this problem, Vlad. We can take them off whatever mind control scheme villain has trapped them in, and we can help them and end this once and for all. This is an excellent turn of events. An excellent. I started to say. 
My sarcastic and defiant tone did not affect C.W. I questioned him unapologetically. An excellent turn of events. C. Why is Major Skitties groaning at you like a rabid animal? What do you mean by mind control? Those can't be DP officers, C. The DP officers were killed. They are supposed to be dead. C.W. felt the hope of an answer to these problems elevate his mood, much like someone in denial. They aren't dead, Vlad. They aren't dead. Major Skitties is here with me, and he is not dead. He said, oblivious to the horrible creature that growled and clawed at him, even as it shredded parts of his DP uniform, exposing his indestructible suit underneath. C.W. shifted his attention away from me. Commander. He spoke into the air while his eyes sparkled with optimism and stared into the distance. Major Skitties is alive. Our officers are alive. This is ridiculous, C, I said, knowing I wouldn't change his mind. C.W. smiled at my words as if I were ignorant of the truth. He then gently fastened the seatbelt around the monster and looked around at the ship while a plan formed in his head. We can save them all, he triumphantly said as he sat in the co-pilot's chair. I will use this vessel to get to the planet's surface faster. Commander? I called out, hoping he would acknowledge the ridiculousness of it all. Thoughts? Captain. The commander finally replied. C.W. felt an immediate source of encouragement. I did not. Take it. The commander said. It is a brilliant idea if you can navigate it away from the armada. We are analyzing the data Vlad has sent us, and will come up with a plan shortly to reclaim our ships and rescue our officers. Major Skitty's groaning stopped. Smiling, C.W. turned to look at him, hoping to see the Major showing signs of improvement already. Major Skitty's reached forward and pushed a button on the cockpit. The speakers blared out. Self-destruct activated. C.W.'s mouth fell wide open in astonishment in the millisecond it took him to process what had just happened, and without further warning, the ship exploded.